Hey guys, welcome to Unit 2. We have survived one of the four units so far, which means we're a quarter of the way through the class. We're going to start out Unit 2 with Chapter 6. And in Chapter 6, we have three subtopics. And our first topic is all about what microbes need to grow. So why is this topic important? And this is going to be an underlying theme for all three topics in Chapter 6, is that it's two parts. We need to understand what microbes need to grow in order to be able to grow them for laboratory experiments and to be able to inhibit their growth in situations where we don't want their growth, like in a hospital room. So if we know what they need, we can either supply it or um, not allow them to have that. So here are our topic objectives. We got a long list for this one and I know it's going to be a little bit crazy. The first two topics in this unit are really um, full of a lot of dense vocabulary and topics. And then unit three or topic three is a little bit easier. So hopefully it'll back off a little bit for you. But as always, let me know if you have any questions about these, okay? So let's start out with microbial nutrition. Um, all organisms require specific elements in their diet. Just like you and I, microbes are no different. It just happens that they might need slightly different things than we do. So the first term you need to learn is essential nutrient. Essential nutrient is any substance that must be provided by the organism. Now, autotrophs are capable of getting this on their own, but we have to eat it. So that's where this comes from. And there's two types of nutrients within the essential nutrients. There are macronutrients, and these are the things we need in large quantities. So if you think about what elements make up most of the macromolecules, you can kind of guess what we're going to need to get a lot of, specifically carbon, right? We are carbon-based life forms, so we need a lot of carbon. We also need a lot of hydrogen and a lot of oxygen. Micronutrients, on the, other, on the other hand, are trace elements, which means that we don't need a whole lot of them. So you just need a little bit to get what you need. So that's what helps us out there. And so some examples we have are manganese, zinc, nickel, etc. So these are kind of things that sometimes you get from vitamins, right? Or leafy green vegetables if you eat like you're supposed to. One important term to note, and we probably won't use it again, but just to clarify, is if you hear something referred to as organic, when we talk about that in sciences, we're not talking about whether or not they use pesticides. We're talking about it being a molecule that contains carbon and hydrogen. So if it has carbon and hydrogen, it is considered an organic molecule. Whereas if it doesn't have carbon and hydrogen, both of them, it could have just carbon, just hydrogen, um, it is considered inorganic. So that's really important to make sure you have that settled. So let's look at an example of E. coli and what they have. The number one thing that all cells have to have is a lot of water. This is why we drink water. We need, a, uh, we need that. In the E. coli, for example, 70% of the cell is water. The next biggest group within that is proteins. So they have about 50%. This means it's really important that E. coli brings in the nutrients they need in order to make amino acids for those proteins. And then you can see the rest of the breakdown here on the list. Um, it's not super important to memorize this, but I do want you to be familiar with some of the bigger ideas, such as proteins make up 50% of the dry weight. What does dry weight mean? What it means is if we take the cell, dehydrate it, remove all the water, and we take the weight that's left and we separate out the proteins, 50% of that leftover weight is protein. So that's pretty big, right? Especially when you consider that nucleic acids are, oh, are the next biggest at 20%. So proteins make up half of the dry weight. One important thing to note too is that there are six main um, elements that are needed by the cell. These are carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, and phosphorus. So it's really, oh and sulfur. <laughs> it helps if you can count the six. And sulfur. Um, those are really important. Um, those are the most important elements. The rest of them are not as important. So that's a good place to also make a note. So it's not for this slide, really the big thing is to understand that water is the biggest component followed by proteins and there are a handful of our standard elements that you and I always think about when we think of elements that are needed by the cell. So what do microbes eat? I've already used this term once and I think we've used it before in the semester, but we have two different types of categories of microbes. We have autotrophs, which are self-feeders, and we have heterotrophs, which have to get the food from somewhere else. We are heterotrophs. We cannot generate our own food. Laying out in the sunlight does not do anything for you and me besides give us sunburns or for those lucky few tans. So autotrophs, we always think about plants, but this is microbiology, so we need to think of photosynthetic 
um, algae or cyanobacteria, things like that. So that's where these photoautotrophs come from. There's another type of autotroph though, and these are chemoautotrophs, and these are able to get all their nutrients from um, inorganic molecules. So that's the difference between phototrophs and chemoautotrophs. Really the big focus for us is phototrophs. We don't talk about chemoautotrophs too much, but it's good to be aware of them. We then have several types of heterotrophs, right? Heterotrophs have to get their carbon from an organic source. This means that they can't bring in CO2. Now there are some heterotrophs that can still use sunlight, but like with the plant with photosynthesis, they get their carbon from CO2 and then use the sunlight to help convert that to organic molecules. Photoheterotrophs have to bring in that carbon from another source and then they use the sunlight to help convert that. So you can see the example here is purple green photosynthetic bacteria. We then have chemoheterotrophs and these um, can metabolize things from other compounds. So that's another example of a chemoautotroph. And there are two main types of, of chemoautotrophs. There are the saprobes and the parasites. The saprobes are decomposers. These guys, they're, you know, whenever you're watching CSI and they're like, they've been dead for this long because of these kind of organisms. That's what a saprobe is. Whereas a parasite, they live on it all the time. Okay, so that's the difference between those two as far as microbial classifications go. So make sure you understand the two main classifications based on carbon source. So do they get it from an organic or an inorganic source? Inorganic being CO2, organic being anything else. And then once we're in those two classifications, or autotroph or heterotroph, are they a photoautotroph or a chemoautotroph? Or are they a photoheterotroph or a chemoautotroph? Or a chemoheterotroph? And then what are the two sub uh, subcategories of chemoheterotrophs? Remember, we're trying to take this with a microbial bent. Even though it's easy to start thinking about it through, um, from our lenses, the main important thing is that you eventually focus in on how the microbes are handling this. Okay, so now let's look at essential nutrients. I already told you about these six, and um, I don't. I'm not going to read you this table. What I want you to know about this table is be familiar with some of the big ideas on that. So for instance, where do we find carbon? Um, what are some examples of why they are important? Just kind of try to pull out the big ideas from this table, okay? If you have any questions about them, let me know. But we're not looking for an encyclopedia. You don't need to memorize this table. Just try to get the big ideas. Alright, so so we've talked about what we need to um, eat, what microbes need to eat to be able to um, live, but now let's talk about how they get them into the cell. Okay, so there are two main processes or two types of processes. We have passive transport and active transport. Passive transport does not require energy and why this doesn't require energy is because the molecules will move down the concentration gradient. This means that outside the cell there's a lot more of said compound and not very much inside the cell. So it's easy for it to come in. Think of this as like a dam. You know, if we open up a little door in the dam, a whole bunch of water is going to rush out and it's not going to need any energy to do that because it's moving down the concentration gradient. The two examples of this are simple diffusion and this the example from your book is putting a sugar cube in a cup of coffee for instance and this just allows things to evenly disperse. I like to use an example of think about when you're boarding a plane like a southwest plane since you don't have seat assignments. People don't come in and just file in evenly within the seats, right? You come in, someone sits up front, someone sits in the back, you kind of scatter throughout the room and, or with throughout the plane and that's kind of like diffusion, right? Nobody sits in that middle seat until they absolutely have to. And that's how simple diffusion works. So it's, we're looking for an even mixture. Another example, well, before I move on to facilitated diffusion, one more important aspect of simple diffusion is that the molecules are really small. So they can generally diffuse right through the membrane of the cell. In facilitated diffusion, the molecules are too big to just simply diffuse. The same, pr same principles apply. There's a really big concentration of it outside the cell, not so much inside the cell. But because they're so big, they have to be transported across the membrane via a protein. And you can see that here on the left-hand side. So now let's talk about active transport. Active transport requires energy. So the cell must really want this in order to bring it in. Now the general reason why it needs to do this is because the um, either it's really big 
or because the concentration of it in the cell is already higher than outside the cell, but the cell wants to maintain a really high balance of this within it. So the first one is the carrier mediated activated transport. This is just like facilitated diffusion, except for that it requires energy. So you can see here with the protein, it'll bring the molecule into the cell, use ATP to help that protein carry it across, and then deposit that within the cell. Notice how the concentration gradient is higher inside the cell than it is outside the cell. The next option is group translocation. So what happens in this case is there's something outside the cell. The cell wants it, but it wants it in a slightly different form. So it's going to pass through an enzyme, be transformed using energy to be created into something new within the cell. And you can see that here on this picture. We start with the little um, red rice looking nuggets. They go through the enzyme and then they look like candy corn. Okay, so that's kind of what's happening here. They're being transformed into what the cell needs. The last one is bulk transport, and there are two types of bulk transport. There's phagocytosis and there's pinocytosis. We've talked a little bit about phagocytosis this semester, especially when we talked about like the endosymbiont theory. In phagocytosis, the cell is eating. We call it cell eating. They will bring in large particles into the cell and then digest them in the phagosome. In pinocytosis, little, drop, little droplets are brought into the cell through um, a smaller process like an, of um, similar to phagocytosis, but it's, it's an endocytosis process, so just little bits brought in. Big thing about pinocytosis is that they're bringing in water, and that's why it's called cell drinking. So those are the two big types of bulk transport across the membrane. They bring in particles and use some of their membrane to help capture that and bring that into the cell. So really what's important here is that you understand the five different types and what they're used for and how that works within the cell. The last thing for this topic is that we need to talk about osmosis. Osmosis and osmotic balance is really, hard, really important for the cell. If the cell has a cell wall, it can keep it from rupturing. If the cell doesn't have a cell wall or something's wrong with that cell wall, too much water can flow into the cell and cause it to rupture, or too little and it will flow out and it will shrivel up. Okay, and you can see some of those examples here. Now, we have a couple different solutions, and whenever we talk about tonicity with solutions, we're always talking about two solutions comparatively speaking. You can't have an isotonic solution on its own. You know, I have a cup of water here, it's not anything until I compare it to something else, okay? Isotonic means that it's equal. So whenever we talk about like IV fluids, people always say that they're getting isotonic saline. That means that that saline is balanced to be exactly our blood concentration saline. Because if we were to add something that was just water directly into our veins, our cells would um, would rupture. So it would be bad. It would be really bad because all the water would rush right into our cells. So it's really important that we balance out that salt concentration. A hypotonic solution is too little. There's so much less solute on the outside of the cell that the water is going to come in and try to balance out the solute concentration. This causes the cell to get really fat and if it has a membrane or a wall it'll be able to keep it from um, exploding. But if it doesn't have a wall like our cells don't it will rupture and die. The opposite is true in a hypertonic solution. So if you were to take an E. coli cell, put it into a salt solution, what's going to happen is all the water, that 70% that we were talking about, is going to rush out of the cell and try to even out the solute concentration on both sides. It's going to cause the cell to shrivel up inside the cell wall. Okay, And that's not good either. That's called plasmolysis. And depending on what's going on, the cell will, could then die. So it's really important to understand these different concepts in osmosis. And I know I went through that a little bit fast, but I have some videos uploaded for you, so if you have any questions about them, you can look through those. So this is the end of this topic. We did some things a little bit fast, but it's important that you get the, ter the terms right. Make sure you understand our types of feeders. Make sure you understand types of solutions. Make sure you understand types of diffusion. And what is important for the cell as far as molecular components go. And if you have any questions about your objectives or anything like that, please let me know either by email or in class. Thanks, guys.